You can find all things Lakeland on our Church Center app or at lakeland.org. Amen. Hey, who's been encouraged already in church? Gosh, what a great song. That last one was new to me in the first service, and my my heart is just still rejoicing. When the same historic gospel gets restated freshly out of worship, it just stirs our hearts. So so glad you're here. If we haven't met, my name is Dan Warehouser. I'm on staff at Lakeland. I want to welcome you here and online. Uh, Greet the person next to you. Go ahead and say hello. Just do that real quick, because we're here together. Tell them thanks for sitting next to me. I still think that's funny, so you're going to have to endure my asking you to do that for the foreseeable future. No matter where you are today in your journey, who you need is the Lord. And I'll just say, please pray for me, because there's something I'm wrestling with, just unrelated, but just one connection point that just feels out of whack, and I feel like I'm wrestling a bit this morning, so I just share that with you to say, please be praying for me. I am grateful for the way that the Lord... um, uh, balances what happens in our lives on Saturday. I had a chance to meet with a couple that's just started coming to Lakeland recently. They saw us online and then are in a season where they want God in their lives. And so we met and they were eager and the gospel was like new news. And they gladly said, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. So we put roses in front when folks make a first time profession of faith. So we're just celebrating that. You're in the room right now. You know who I'm talking about. So may may we need a rose garden, right, in the days ahead. So grateful for that. Um, I, I, I haven't ever mentioned this before, but have you ever noticed the phenomenon that sometimes when you're reading the Bible in two more than one places, you run across some of the same teaching said differently that augments the other? Do you know what I'm saying? It's sort of like, oh, that's just like this. I ran across something about a month ago that so speaks to our series. Let me just share the story. Um, my, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband... Um, the Lord summoned him home to heaven a few weeks ago. I think I've told you about that. And it worked out providentially that I had a chance to meet with him just days before he died. He'd been, su- he'd been suffering the effects of a stroke for 13 years. I mean, it was, it, he was ready. It was time. But I met with Gary, who, was a, who, who I had I counted 88 Zoom calls with over the last couple of years, reading the Bible and praying, because my sister said, encourage him. And I'm like, all right, well, we'll read the Bible and pray together. So I remember kneeling, kneeling with him, and I was this close to Gary, who was conscious and cognizant and so forth, I had been reading Psalm 84. And I'd spent a fair amount of time in Psalm 84, and I realized Psalm 84 was exactly the right passage to read to my brother-in-law who was about to meet Jesus. Let me just share the story. Psalm 84, verse 1, pictures a, a, a worshiper on the way to Jerusalem in the Old Covenant to meet with God in the temple. He is ecstatic that he's going to be closer to Yahweh. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. He can't wait to get to the temple because in the old covenant, Yahweh dwelled in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. Now today, God, after the cross and resurrection of Christ, has poured his spirit into anyone who believes in him as a follower of Jesus. So we now are the temple. But in the old covenant, if you... Today, you want to be close to Jesus, just get near other Christians. But in the Old Covenant, you had to go to Jerusalem. So this man is on his journey. Three times a year, Israel was to go up to Jerusalem. He's on that journey. He can't wait to get there to be closer to God. He says, my heart and my flesh sing for joy. He's singing with his mouth and from his heart and with his entire body, he's singing because he's going to get to be near the Lord. Verse 4, it occurs to him. As he goes up, blessed are those who dwell in your house. He's like, do you realize, he says to his traveling companions, there are actually people who get to live in the temple. Oh, they're always singing. What a, what a life to be that close to the Lord all of the time, he says. In whose hearts, I love this line. This is really significant. I'm sorry. So blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praises. Verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. He's finding a strength 
in him that is his anticipation for the Lord. And as I overlay the new covenant on this, I would say, blessed are those who rely, look for and rely upon the Holy Spirit who indwells them to actually infuse everything they think, they want, they say, they do in every interaction with any person so that more is going on when they interact with people in the world than just them. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and in whose hearts are the highways of Zion. What a great line. Some translations say, who have set their heart on pilgrimage. I'm like, oh, that's us. We are on a May, it, may, there, may in your heart be a highway to Zion so you can't wait to see God face to face. That's what, what, what's this have to do with Gary? That's the line. And as I knelt before my brother, just kind of this close, and I read this, I said, Gary, I'm going to pray God heals you, but barring that, and he, he may heal you by bringing you to himself, your, your responsibility for the next couple hours and days is to set your heart on pilgrimage until you see God face to face in Zion. That's what your job, it was holy. I mean, I just feel it right now. The Lord was, gosh, the Lord was in the room as we shared that together. And so what an honor that is. Now, what does that have to do with our series about being unexpected? It's the next line. And the next line answers the question, what do, what do God's people living in this world whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, who, who seek God every, seek first the kingdom of God, who seek the face of God every day, and ultimately can't wait to see him face to face. What effect do those people have in this world in which we're living? And that's what verse 6 tells us. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. You know what the valley of Baca means? It's the valley of tears. What is the valley of tears? It's life in this world. I mean, there are so many goodnesses and kindnesses God surrounds us with. We swim in them every day. I am not at all making light of that. But the truth is, in this life, in this world, it is, it is also the valley of tears. Who of us have not had people speak words to us intended to harm us that we remember for years because they keep afflicting us? Who of us have not been used by someone else for their own advancement at our expense? Sometimes in horrible ways. Who of us have not felt the pain of being unwelcome, inadequate, or unwanted? Who of us have not been in a place where someone who could have helped us wouldn't lift a finger to do so? Who of us have not felt the loss, even today, of people that we love who aren't in this world anymore, or the fear of people we love who may not be in this world anymore, who have been treated unjustly? You live in this world. It's the valley of tears. Think about it. The people Jesus came to save crucified him. And that same spirit exists in the world. As he sends us into the world, we're going to encounter it. But what impact do God's people, whose heart is set on seeking the face of God, what effect do we have? And that's what this text tells us. As the earth was made to receive water so that from it would grow life, So the hearts of people in the world, when they experience God's people living in obedience to his commands, living like him, experience life to the core of their soul, they see something and they just know that is good, that is right. I don't know how you're doing that. That is noble and it's like life-giving. Totally unexpected that God's people would live the way they do and life-giving. It was certainly that way with Jesus. When the Roman centurion, who was supervising Jesus' execution, who had executed all kinds of people, saw how Jesus died, how he responded, he was astonished. We read in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This man saw Jesus loving his enemies while they killed him. He heard him praying that his father would forgive them for they know not what they do. He saw a man who was surrounded with a swarm of tornadic anger and evil coming at him, responding in every way with good. And the only explanation he had for it was this man was not of this earth. 
this man was the son of God. Does God not want to form Christ in us? Do we not carry around that Jesus in us? Yes. He wants us to become like him (laughs) so that he would be on display in the world in which we're living. Jesus not only sent us into the world with a life-transforming message of of Christ, came to die for our sins, raised again so we could be forgiven and reconciled to God and become worshipers of him again, the greatest news anyone's ever heard, but he sends us into the world with lives that have themselves actually been transformed and are being transformed by that very message that we're sharing, which validates the truthfulness of our message. And I'm not saying any of us do this perfectly. I'm not, I'm not saying that for some of us it doesn't take time that we're working on the things we're talking about, loving your enemies and returning eat good for evil. I'm not saying that, oh, I got it now. Thanks, Dan. I mean, I'm not saying we don't have to work at that, but any progress towards obedience to this shows the difference of Christ. And people see it and they notice it when we live like him. So filled with God's spirit, we can actually share our best with people who can do nothing to repay us. We can actually practice servanthood all of the time. We can be driven by something other than greed, just like everybody else. We can live our lives, you'll hear this next week, not gripped by fear. Even though we we have the convictions of God and what holiness is, we can engage with people in the world without cursing them through judgment. We can live different lives. And when we do, when we just try to do what Jesus wants, it stands out. I'll just share a small example of it. Um, And it's about me, so that feels a little odd, but it just makes this point. There's a restaurant I go to in Grays Lake uh, when I I can. I love it. It's It's a great place to go. And I had a friend from out of town from Colorado who had come to work on the website of another friend's church. So we met at this restaurant for breakfast. And I introduced them, and we talked for a bit. Then I got up and left because they had work to do. Well, apparently, after I walked out the door, my friend tells me the story. A waitress who's standing there taking an order saw me go and then announced to the entire diner, there goes a great man of God. (laughs) Yeah, like she doesn't know me very much, right? Let's just (laughs) fix that right now. If you think that of me, just get to know me a little while, and then I'll disappoint you. Just, right? And that's the truth. But at that point, I'd probably been there 10 or 12 times. And I'm I'm always trying, I'm always, when when I'm in, it is true, when I'm in restaurants, I pray for the servers, and I look for an opportunity, and God had given one a few weeks before. I came in with work, and I was doing my thing, and she came over, and I saw something in her eyes, and I put down my work, and I said, how are you? And she just shared a deep pain in her life. And so I said, I know this is going to really sound odd, but I'm I'm a Christian. I'm actually a pastor. Could I just, could I pray for you? And she, and she said, would you? And sat down. And I just prayed for her. Any one of us could do this at any point. It wasn't a big deal. But apparently, weeks later, it had, God had had such an impact through that little thing that I had forgotten because it was him. Because he freights our actions with his presence. You have no idea how you're impacting the people around you. That is precisely what this whole series is about being unexpected, living in keeping with the way Christ has. So this is the last of these first three messages which all kind of go together. And we're taking enough time on it so we we don't go, huh, I should work on that and not work on that. I'm wading into the, the first bad way we misrepresent Jesus. That he actually, and, and said, let's live differently than this. And so he actually wants us to love our enemies. Trey shared that two weeks ago, just really, really. He wants us to love our enemies. And the way we can do that underneath is if we, were, if we make it our aim to be on a greater mission than retaliating, that we aim to respond to evil that comes our way with goodness. Well, the third part of that is what we talk about today. And today's message is that we can do that if we're working hard as Christians on being unoffendable. Unoffendable. He wants us to be like that. We live the heart of Jesus when we're unoffendable. God wants us to carry his heart into the world, and that will be unexpected. Let me just give you a quiz. Let's see how unoffendable you are, okay? Remember the days in tolling 
before we had the little sensors, when you had to actually put change in the toll booth. Anybody remember those days? 40 cents, that's what I remember, right? Not 50, 40. It's always an odd number. You're on the toll booth behind a car that's been there for a minute. A minute. As the owner of the car in front of you is fishing around underneath the seat for change. Do you, A, take a deep breath and thank God for the minute that you get to just be still? Do you, B, offer a prayer for this poor person because you know they're probably humiliated and blood pressure is going through the roof? Do you, C, think, I bet I could ram my car between (laughs) the car and the median? You get another call from a telemarketer who actually somehow has a number with your area code and it says Mike on it. (laughs) You feel so betrayed. You answer the phone. Again, do you think, I bet this person hasn't had a person listen to him all day. I've got 35 minutes. I will listen to the entire presentation. (laughs) Do you think, okay, I'll go ahead and buy something just so they can go to their boss and say, I sold something. Do you see, think, I wonder if it's possible to physically reach through my cell phone and have my hand come out on their phone on the other end so I can grab them by the throat and tell them, don't ever call me again. Okay, what about when it's about something that matters? What about when your boss treats you with dishonor and disrespect every single day? What about when someone um, expects you to do work that is not your job or who take credit for work that you have done? What about when you're around somebody whose lifestyle is remarkably offensive to you do you draw away from them or because you're offended or do you, do you draw close to them? How do you and I respond when we live in this world? And the real question is, are you willing for the Lord to make you unoffendable? I actually think this is the teaching of Jesus in one verse in Mark chapter 11. If you do this, because you're honoring the Lord who calls you to this, because you believe him that when he commands you to something, it's for your good, because you want to live on a greater mission than just retaliating like everybody else. If you work in a place of saying, I don't want a fence to be, I, it isn't that I, I'm going to cage it and just kind of every now and then pull it out. I actually want to be unoffendable to my core from now on, even though you may struggle with it, will struggle with it. That's what I want. Then you're in a place to make live a life that is unexpected that will cause people to say, how are you doing that? We see this in Mark 11. Let's start with the importance of being unoffendable. Mark 11, verse 22. Mostly we'll be in verse 25, but this sets the context. The importance of being unoffendable. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are returning from Jerusalem to where they're camping that night. He's spending days in Jerusalem and then leaving the city. As they walk by a fig tree a fig tree that several hours before Jesus had prayed, may you wither and never bear any figs again. As they walked by it, a couple hours later, the disciples realized it had withered. Jesus' prayer was answered. Now, it's off topic for me to explain the fig tree, which is fascinating and full of meaning. But the conversation wasn't about the fig tree with the disciples. It was about how stunned they were that God answered his prayer. He prayed, be withered. A couple hours later, it was withered. And the disciples looked at him, astonished, and they said, look, the tree you prayed over has been withered. And so in verse 22, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Why does this surprise you? (laughs) Don't be surprised that God would answer a prayer because he is, after all, God. He can answer prayer like that. And then Jesus continues, because they clearly were shocked when Jesus prayed it. They didn't think anything would happen. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Jesus wants his disciples to realize that when they pray to God, God answers. And they will never face a threat a person, a circumstance, an empire, 
over which the God to whom they pray does not have absolute authority to do with as he pleases. He says, pray like that. Pray believing that God can do this work. Now, the key is, it matters to God that you believe. It matters that you have faith. So verse 24, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it, that you have received it. That's what he says. Now, I'm going to just pause. I appreciate that when Jesus talks about prayer, he notes that prayer is asking. That's kind of important. Prayer is not dictating to God what he will do. It is asking God to do what it is that you're asking. And you're asking him not only because you know he's the only one that can do what you're asking, you're asking because, in a sense, you're asking permission. You're saying, is this what you want? I'm asking that you would do this thing. Is this in keeping with what it is that you would want? Right? We, when we ask, asking isn't dictating. Asking is asking. And he wants us to believe that when we pray, God, is this what you want, that God can and will do anything all the way up to taking Mount Everest and throwing it into the Pacific Ocean. That that's the level of response God has. He says, do this and it will be yours. So certain is God's willingness to answer our prayers for his will to be done that Jesus speaks of these prayers as something we already have while we're asking. We're asking, we already have it. As the disciples go into the world, how important is their prayer life going to be? Huge. So he wants them to understand prayer. Now, I, I have to stop at one point and say, I think there are unhelpful ways these verses have been understood. It's unhelpful when people focus on our faith to the point of saying the determining factor of whether or not God will answer your prayer is whether you have enough faith without, first of all, asking, is the thing you're asking for God's will? <laughs> right? It's, it, what do, when, if we're going to pray in the world for things to happen in the world, don't we want it to be God's will to be done? What else would we pray for except that God's will would be done? Why would we want anything to be done except that God's will would be done? So when we pray, there is, you're not lacking faith to have the humility to say, you know this whole thing way better than I do. It seems really good for me to pray this. But I'm not lacking faith because I trust his will knowledge more than mine. And I'm certainly not. Some people who teach, who teach, if you have enough faith, no matter what it is, you'll have it. And they add to that, and you'll have it immediately. Immediately. So if when, and we're not talking about getting a new car. I mean, we're talking about praying for people we love who are dying. I mean, I get what a big deal that is. But friends, the tense of this verb, ask, is indicative. It, it, it pictures continuous asking. God doesn't answer on our timetable. It is injurious for us to tell anyone, if you have enough faith, whatever you ask, whether it's God's will or not, God will do. And I'm not trying to step away from the promise of this text, but I'm trying to live in, the, in all that Scripture has to say. And in light of that, friends, if you want God's will to be done and you pray God's will would be done, you had better believe the Lord, the Lord will move heaven and earth Sometimes he says yes, now. Sometimes he says yes, but his yes is later. Sometimes he says yes, but his yes is to the need behind what you're saying, not to what you're saying. And if this were a message on prayer, I would now unpack that in great detail and share illustrations and so forth. But this is a message on being unoffendable. Okay, Dan, is this just another, why are we talking about prayer? Here's the reason why. Because having taught his disciples this unbelievable promise of the power of prayer as they go into the world in this ministry. Then verse 25, he says something remarkable. And whenever you stand praying, every single time you engage in this incredibly powerful ministry of prayer, forgive if anyone, if you have anything against anyone. Now, there are rides. Remember, like there was a ride, I remember, on playgrounds when you go to uh, this, in the grocery store, they'd set up uh, like a mini circus, and it would, you'd get in this car, and it would spin, but then the whole thing would, like, move around like this, so you'd, like, go flying to the edge, and then you'd suddenly get, anyone remember the ride that I'm talking about? I don't know, the whirly, whatever, vomit, vomitorium, whatever that was called. <laughs> Just as you come to the inertia, never mind, I want, <laughs> that was the youth pastor and me coming out. Anyways, 
this verse feels like that moment when you're going this way and, and all of a sudden you're thrown that way. He's just talked about these incredible things about prayer. And then he says, and the first thing you should pay attention to when you go to engage in this prayer is that you have forgiven anyone who has ever done anything to you. You attend to that first. That you, I think we could say, would be unoffendable. That Jesus would raise are being unoffendable to this level tells me it's important. Okay, well, what's it mean? What's the meaning of being unoffendable, my term? We should know, right? Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So we should know what this means. Well, this, mean, this clearly covers all of our prayers. Whenever you stand praying for anything at any time, pay attention to this. Every single time you pray, we should search our heart and ask us if we should do this. And this covers all of our history. If anyone at any time has ever done anything, forgive, he says. Forgive. The scope of Jesus' command here is absolute. Before you get any further in prayer, be assured that you're not nursing and massaging and somehow liking your anger at another person. Get rid of all of it. Now, to be clear, Jesus is not saying that someone's harm against us wasn't harmful. Right? He, wasn't, he, he doesn't say, come on, really, it, it wasn't that big a deal. He isn't saying this. The reason that you have something against someone is probably because they've done something to you that gives you reason to want to have something against them. Right? And so sometimes those things are huge. I just connected with a couple guys this last week who talked about wounds in their past in careers where they were mishandled at work. And you know what, what that meant? It meant they not only lost their job, they had to move their family across the country, and they're still living with the reality of what's been done to them. That's not a small thing. Some people today in this room right now still have a hard time trusting people in general and men in particular. Because at one time in their life, some guy did that thing that robbed them of their safety as they walked through life. I am not saying that's not a big deal. Some of us are here, and people we know still limp. Because You might still limp because that kid got drunk and got in a car, or your child might not be here because that kid got drunk in a car. So the effects of harm that have come our way. He's not saying, look, you, it's not really that big a deal. He's not saying that. Neither was there taking spikes and putting them in, a, in his wrists and pounding them into the beam. Neither was his enemies hanging him in the stand on the cross so that he would suffer a horrible death. Right? That's not inconsequential. And yet, there he is, praying. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And he's in us. And he wants that heart in us. And you live that life, <laughs> it'll be unexpected. What a great promise. Jesus still, Jesus says, if you're to be a part of his work, the first responsibility you have when you come to God in prayer, without exception, is to forgive the people who've harmed you. He wants us to become like him. So what's that mean exactly? We're helped to understand the meaning of these words. That helps us understand what he is saying and what he isn't saying. So when you read Strong's Concordance and look up the word that's described in this text, it's a fit in me. Can we go to that? This is actually from that text. Verb, third person singular, aorist, active subjunctive. To forgive means, Strong's defines words with synonyms. So to permit, release, neglect, abandon. Forgiveness is a call to permit, release, neglect, and abandon someone's sin against us. First of all, permit. When you forgive, you're permitting their offense. And what that doesn't mean is you're not saying, hey, that's offensive, stop it. What that means is you are not taking it upon yourself, as we saw last week, to retaliate and get even. You're permitting the fact that evil was just done, and you're not going to enter into it also. That's the point. doesn't mean you don't call the police doesn't mean you don't call sin sin. It doesn't call, sir, can I just tell you, that's, that's wrong, I wouldn't do that. But what it means is you permit the evil without at all trying to overcome it and retaliate. You know, it's so, it's so fascinating 
Because when evil comes your way, it's helpful to realize, doesn't the Lord say, vengeance is, what's he say? Vengeance is, I will repay. Oh, that helps. Because <laughs> God guarantees that the sin against you will be confronted and dealt with, either on the cross or in judgment, one or the, one or the other. It will be dealt with. And oh, by the way, Jesus so identifies with you as his beloved uh, brother and the Father so identifies with you as your, his beloved child. Remember when Saul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians? Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He, I, people's sin against us is sin against him. That's really helpful to remember. So I, I get the reason that permit is part of what's involved. Releasing is a second word. When somebody harms you, they owe you. Right? Have we ever said that? You owe me one. Isn't it fascinating that somehow we use the, the vocabulary of commerce to describe wound? You owe me. Well, forgiveness is making a decision to release a person from their obligation to us. Because you know God is the one who's going to collect on this. I, I choose to no longer hold your sin against me against you. Third, forgiveness means neglecting. Neglecting retaliation right? We choose, to, we choose to try to do what God does. I forgive you, and I put your sins behind my back and drop them in the sea of forgetfulness. We actually try to forget. And finally, forgiveness means abandoning. When we forgive, we're abandoning the right to take revenge, Romans 12. We're abandoning our right to have a good reputation, Mark 5. We're abandoning our right to hate our enemy, Matthew 5. We're abandoning our right to be honored and served because we get offended when we're not honored and served. We're abandoning that right. Mark chapter 10. We're abandoning our right to understand God's will before we obey him. Hebrews 11. We're abandoning our right to hold a grudge. Colossians 3. We're abandoning our right to complain. Philippians 2.14. We're abandoning our right to put ourselves first because we've denied ourselves. That's why we started this whole series. When our response to people who have offended us when, uh, is to not hold something against someone else, we are living an unoffendable life. Now, if you're familiar with it, I got this word and a number of these ideas from a book that was written by Brent Hansen called Unoffendable. And if you want to make progress in this area, I'd suggest you buy it and read it. But let me, let me just read a few things that Brent says in this book on this topic. I used to think, he said, it was incumbent upon a Christian to take offense. <laughs> right? Because if we're going to fight evil in the world, right? I now think we should be the most refresh refreshingly unoffended people on the planet that seems to spin on the axis of offense. Forfeiting our right to anger makes us deny ourselves and makes us other-centered. When we start living this way, it changes everything. He goes on to say, actually, it is not even, can we go to the next one? Actually, it is not even forfeiting a right because the right doesn't exist in the first place. <laughs> we've, we've been told to forgive. We're told to forgive. That means anger has to go whether we've decided that our anger is righteous or not. He goes on. Choosing not to take offense is not simply about ignoring wrongs. If somebody, say, cuts in front of the line, you can address the situation. You don't have to simply accept it. But you can act without contempt, anger, and bitterness. And then he quotes Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul says, let all. Do you know what all means? Really, take that to heart. Let all bitterness and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you. Not stored for later use, put away. We have, we have a dog named Ginger going on five months. A couple times a week, guess what I do? I walk out in our yard with a pooper scooper <laughs> to pick up after our, dog, our dog's leaving. That's what we say. What do you think I do with our dog's leavings? Do I store them for later? Yep. I put them away. 
put them away along with malice. Can you say in your heart today, God, I want you to put these away. I don't ever want to see these again. If you can't, that's not good. Are you willing to become willing to put away all offense? This is a really big deal to the Lord because apparently when his people live in unity or when, when, when <laughs> wound is overcome in reconciliation, that is a beautiful and a holy and a glorious thing. And he wants us to be a part of that all of the time. But we have to overcome something to do that. So Hansen goes on to write, we won't often admit this, but we like being angry. I mean, we don't like the cause of the anger, to be sure. We just like thinking that we've got something on someone. We humans are experts at casting ourselves as the victims and rewriting narratives that put us at the center of injustices. Does anybody ever do that? I don't often get into a bad place with my wife, but when it happens, it's amazing how I frame everything that's happened so that I am completely innocent of all wrongdoing. And it's my wife who is being unreasonable. And when I calmly and gently share this with her, a glow appears from heaven. And she takes her hands like this and she says, oh, blessed husband. Thank you for showing me the error of my ways. And this isn't about Lisa, this is about me. It's about the fact that, you know, science has shown that actually memory is not a reliable thing. You tell yourself something like 10 times one way, and that's how you actually remember it. So much for the witness system in our legal, <laughs> gosh. We are, we are always deceiving ourselves. We always want to see ourselves as the victims. Remember Jeremiah, it says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Deceitful isn't a, a, a larger, an enlarger of desperate. In other words, Jeremiah isn't saying your hearts are desperately wicked. They're so desperately wicked. They're deceitfully wicked. Like that's really desperately wicked. What that means is that we're deceitful. The way our hearts are wicked is that we're deceitful. We deceive ourselves. We don't want to know the truth about ourselves. And so when we're offended, some amount of our offense may have nothing to do with what they've done, or the amount of response we have may have everything to do with us. So here's what he says. Here's what I think. Given that we all, that we're to get rid of anger, anger will happen, we're human, but we can't keep it. Like the Reverend King, we can recognize injustice, grieve it, act against it, but without rage, make malice um, without rage, without malice, without anger. We have enough motivation, I hope, to defend the defenseless and to protect the vulnerable without needing anger. Seek justice, love, mercy. You don't have to be angry to do that. Then he goes on to say, people say we have to get angry to fight injustice. But I've noticed that the best police officers don't do their jobs in anger. Isn't that right? When you're angry, are you the most reasonable? <laughs> this is how it is that we want to live. We want to put this away. Now, now, clearly, what Jesus is calling us to here is not the natural way the fallen human heart works. That's why he commands it. He commands us to live what we don't naturally do, but you need the help of God. Several years ago, two parents in our church were talking to their tender old child, and they were on the way to pick up a friend. And this child loved sitting in the middle seat in the back. And so they, as they pulled up to the house of their friend, his mother said, let your friend choose which seat he wants to sit in, and then you sit in another one. The boy replied, he's going to want to sit in the middle seat. To which the mom, like all of Christian parents, ever quick for a teachable moment with the aura and the music from heaven, right? says, because we as Christians put the needs of others in front of our own. And her child threw up his hands in exasperation and said, how do you live like that? <laughs> well, we don't without the enablement of God, which we have. So I want to acknowledge that this is hard. 
But I don't want to undermine at all the fact that if Jesus commands it, he's given his grace and his spirit for us to follow the commands that he's given us. And it starts with obedience. What none of these texts said was that we have warm fuzzies for the people that we're sending debt away from. It doesn't say that we trust now blindly since they've demonstrated that they're not trustworthy. It says that I don't let rage sit in me. No one likes to hear this. We want to think people are worse than us. It's one of our favorite pastimes. Instead of our changing beliefs to match reality, we often rearrange reality in our hearts to match what we want. Okay, so that's what we have to overcome. So again, I am not contesting that someone's sin against us isn't sin. But I am calling us to remember that while the specific sins that we're commanded to forgive others for may be different than the ones that we have to be forgiven for, when God calls me to forgive someone else, I do it as one who has also needed forgiveness. That's actually quite important. I may be looking at somebody who did something I wouldn't do, but they need grace just like I do. I'm helped to realize Jesus has to give us this command because it's not our natural way. So in Hansen's book, the dedication page, you want to know what the dedication page of the book Unoffendable reads? This is how it reads. I literally just (laughs) took a picture of it. The pink is me. I highlighted it. This book was dedicated to all who want grace for themselves but struggle to extend it to others. Oh, wait, that's everybody, (laughs) right? So we all need help to do this. How do we do this? Well, we're helped to remember. Let's just, we're helped to remember, of course, that we ourselves have been forgiven. So back in our passage, the reason to forgive others, we, I mean, we've already said forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, but back to our text, so that your Father who is in heaven will forgive you your trespasses. Remember to forgive means to permit, release, neglect, and abandon. Okay, here's a question. Who of us is grateful that God permitted our sins to be paid for by Christ? Who of us is grateful that God released us from our debt to him because Christ paid this immeasurable debt on our behalf? Gosh. Who of us is grateful that not neglected to give judgment to us because he poured it out on Christ instead? And who of us is glad that God abandoned sending us to hell because he brought hell to the cross in judgment of Christ. How much have we been forgiven? Let that sink in. That's just profound. We forgive as ones who have been forgiven. And then we enter into the heart of God when we follow suit. If you're a follower of Jesus, struggling forgiving, it's, it's, I mean, when he actually says, forgive so your father would forgive you, I don't think he's saying, I I do think he's saying, if you say, I'm not going to forgive, I don't care no matter what, and you remain in that position, you may want to be all the more certain to see that your calling and election is sure, genuinely, because the Spirit of God is pulling you. I am not saying it's a small thing, but if you're struggling and saying, I want to do this, but it is so hard, you're struggling, which is a sign that God's at work in you. Keep leaning in. Make a point to obey. Obedience is a decision. So remember a few months ago, I shared the story of Corrie ten Boom, who had lost her, her, he and, she and her sister, her whole family were sent to German POW camps. Her, uh, and she was in Ravensbrück, and the rest of her family died, and her sister died. And, and her faith became so real in the Lord in that place. And then years later, she's back in Germany telling Germans about the forgiveness of the Lord. And at the end of one talk, who shuffles up to her? but one of the men who had been a guard in her prison. He remembered her. She, didn't, he, she remembered him. He didn't remember her. And he said, Fraulein, thank you so much for talking about God's forgiveness. I have done some horrible things. But since then, I've repented and asked God's forgiveness, and I've become a child of God. And I would just be helped if you would please tell me you forgive me. And Corey said she just froze. He, his hand was out like this, and she, she, she didn't want to touch him. But she'd also just talked about the grace of God, and she thought, how can I not offer forgiveness? And it was like mechanically, she threw her arm into his hand. And the moment they clasped hands, she said, it was like lightning started in my shoulder and carried into our grasp and then into my heart. And I was overwhelmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit and said, from the bottom of my heart, I do forgive you, my brother. It was because she obeyed that God enabled her. So we make a decision to forgive. 
we make a decision to be unoffendable. And I realize these stories are dramatic, but it, it, this is true in small ways. I have a good friend who just shared this last week as we talked about this passage, this story, that she had a neighbor who there had been some level of friendship with and their kids played, but one day some, something happened. Oh my gosh. And suddenly her neighbor didn't like her anymore. It was obvious in their inner... And she said, I don't know what I did, but the change was so dramatic. This person doesn't like me. And she didn't know what to do with, in response to it. She wanted to obey the Bible, to forgive. She wanted to be unoffendable, to use that word more recently that people are talking about. She asked friends, please pray for me. I just, I don't even know what I did. And then she resolved to continue to treat her neighbor exactly as if nothing bad had happened. So when she saw her, she'd wave at her and smile and say hello, bump into each other at the mailbox. And even in the awkwardness, now their kids are still playing together. She tried to just be kind. And she said, I wish I could tell you things changed like that. They didn't, but they did start to change. Slowly, her heart, her attitude changed. And then something surprising happened. A mutual friend of my neighbor and me met my neighbor and mentioned me. And when my friend mentioned to my neighbor me, my neighbor burst into exclamation, She's, she is my best friend. because my friend was unoffendable in the name of Christ. It, this, if we're serious, if we're really serious about being a part of his work in this world, this is a non-negotiable. This is not second-level Christianity. Can we stand together? And I'm going to just ask you for a moment, can you say to the Lord, I want to be unoffendable? I want to bring spring rains to the valley of tears that I'm walking through. I want to live this way because, I, because you call me to it, and so I believe it's good, and I want to live this way because I'm living on a higher mission than just making my life comfortable. I want heaven to be visible through me. I want you to pour out the blessing of the Holy of Holies on my interactions. Father, we love you so who responded to our evil against you, and you Lord, will bring justice in your right way, but you have responded to our evil with good, and you call us to take on Jesus' very heart who prayed for us while we persecuted him. Show us each, right now, a couple ways that we would live this out. And we can do this because you've brought us from where we were to where we are in your love. We worship you.